Hi, everybody. I, I'm going to talk about the bark beetle epidemic today. And um, uh, I love this. This is really exciting. On the first hand, I'm going to tell you uh, this is no big deal. Bark beetles have been around for 35 million years. Conifers have been around for a lot longer than that. And bark beetles have been killing conifers for 35 million years. They, uh, they go into epidemics every 30 to 70 years. This is no big deal. Then immediately I'm going to follow up with, holy smokes, guys, this has never been seen before. Um, yes, it's an epidemic. Yes, epidemics are natural. Never has there been an epidemic like this as long as uh, biologists have been watching. Um, this epidemic stretches from the Sangre de Cristo in New Mexico up to the Yukon territories, that is almost to Alaska, over 1,500 miles. It extends from the Great Plains or the edge of the Great Plains to the Pacific Ocean. And so that's a big square that is approximately 1,500 miles by about 900 miles. It's absolutely enormous. If you've been skiing um, in the area around Dillon or Steamboat or Vale, you look out from the places that uh, you've been skiing for years, and instead of seeing uh, a hillside of green trees, you see 90% of the trees are either red or gray. They're dead. Um, the uh, the uh, British Columbia Ministry of Forests said about four years ago that this is the biggest bark beetle epidemic ever. It's already 10 times as big as the second biggest, and it's still growing in size. Um, the bark beetles have pushed about 400 miles further north than they ever did before. And here in Colorado, uh, the, bark, the people who studied bark beetles in the 1980s will tell you that they sur surveyed bark beetles between 6,000 feet and 9,000 feet. They didn't have to go above 9,000 feet because bark beetles didn't kill trees above 9,000 feet. But this picture was taken at 11,000 feet. And furthermore, it's looking north along the Continental Divide from the west side of Berthoud Pass. And all the way out there, all the way up to Rocky Mountain National Park, is a sea of red. And that's at 11,000 feet. If you turn about 90 degrees and look this way, all you see is red and gray trees. That's 11,000 feet, and just 20 years ago, that didn't happen. Uh, just to show you how general this is in Colorado, uh, this is a picture uh, from Loveland Pass looking down, but it's still, I'm looking at a site above 11,000 feet. Uh, there's more dead trees. Rainbow Curve in Rocky Mountain National Park looking through a sea of red at Long's Peak cross over the Continental Divide to the Forest Canyon. And the Forest Canyon tree line on the eastern side of that valley is a little over 11,000 feet. And you can see all the trees that have been taken. The approach to Cottonwood Pass. Now, uh, some people think this is because of uh, the way we've manipulated the forest or perhaps um, Oh, pollution or something like that. And so I included this, uh, this picture as well. Uh, this is in Forest Canyon. And this uh, little meandering stream is about five miles from the nearest trail. I've been in Forest Canyon. It's awful to walk through because there's so many trees down. And I would guess that not more than half a dozen people get to that site every year. It's about as pristine as pristine places get in, uh, in North America, and yet, there's the bark beetles. There's a cluster of trees killed. There's a cluster of trees. There's a cluster of trees. And we're going to come back to why they kill them in clusters in a little while. Um, here's a poignant anecdote from my perspective. Uh, I found this tree in 1976. Um, that diameter at that elevation indicates that that tree is over 1,500 years old. And I knew it was above the bark beetles. I knew it was on a scree slope and fire couldn't get to it. It was too cold up there for any insects to bother that tree. And I had the confidence that that tree could go easily, easily another thousand years. 
And I took a little solace in that. Um, but this last year, I was up to take some pictures in Rocky Mountain National Park, and I thought I'd go back and photograph that tree again. I'd actually used this uh, to taunt my forestry genetics friends. I, had a, I hosted a meeting of forestry genetics, and I put that tree on the cover. Foresters hate trees that look like that because you can't cut them, you can't get boards out of them or anything like that. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Not anymore. It's dead. Because the bark beetles now are killing trees above 11,000 feet in Rocky Mountain National Park. I was sure that that thing was going to outlive me. Well, here's the culprit. It's the mountain pine beetle. And uh, it's uh, Latin binomial is Dendroctinus ponderosi. And I'm going to organize this talk a little bit by uh, asking the rhetorical question, how do such little beetles kill such immense trees? How do little beetles mow down a forest for 300 or 400 continuous miles as they have in British Columbia? Well, if, if you have a number two pencil, the eraser on that number two pencil is bigger than this beetle. So it's only about a quarter of an inch long. But they kill trees using a couple of, uh, a couple of strategies. One is mass attacks orchestrated by pheromones. The pheromones are chemical signals that are wafted through the air. They not only press the attack, concentrating a large number of beetles on a single tree, but when the battle is won, they call it off, and they, they switch that attack to another tree. Another thing that they do is they have a mutualism with a blue stain fungus. Now, if we could put this beetle underneath a good microscope, we would see it has scallops on its head and on its uh, thorax. Those scallops are called mycangia. That's important because those mycangia, the little divots uh, in the outer surface, but it's like a golf ball surface. They're filled with the spores of blue stain fungus. The only place mycologists can find blue stain fungus is on the beetle and in a tree that the beetle is killing. So they don't occur naturally away from the beetle. The beetle moves them around so the blue stain gets around by being carried by the beetle. The blue stain feeds the offspring of the beetle, that's what the larvae eat, and it helps them kill the tree. And I'll show you that. So that's a mutual, mutualism. They're really tied together. I'm not sure the beetles could kill uh, trees without the blue stain. So I'm going to walk you through the classical uh, life history of the bark beetle as it was known up to about uh, a year ago. And uh, then I'm going to tell you that the game has changed. But let's, let's go to the established and um, well-known life cycle. It's a day in August, and a female emerges from a tree. She flies around for a few hours. She lands on a couple of trees, sniffs them, maybe takes a few bites of the bark, looking for a tree that tastes good. She's also looking for a tree that has low oleoresin pressure. I'm not sure how she senses that, but she's able to do it. When she finds one that looks good to her, she starts tunneling in. As she tunnels in, she severs the resin canals uh, in the bark. And that's like cutting a hose. As soon as she does that, the resin starts flowing from above, and it fills up the hole that she's excavating. And so here, you can see, um, here she is. She's absolutely soaked with resin. And there's a slow motion movement of resin coming out of the tree. And that will start uh, flowing down the bark. That's called a pitch tube. Sometimes that pitch actually tosses the beetle out of the tree. And I'll show you that. This is the defense of the tree. This is the only defense of the tree. So if a tree has a whole lot of resin pressure, because it's got lots and lots of water, a tree might be able to fight off 2,000 beetles. That's been documented push out 2,000 beetles and survive, and photosynthesize the following week. On the other hand, that very same tree, in a drought situation, can be killed by a dozen beetles. So 
the tree's resin pressure, a direct function of the water available to it, tells you whether that tree is resistant or susceptible. And that is one of the reasons why the beetles want trees with low oleoresin pressure. Now, the, uh, the resin is flooding the, uh, the gallery that the female is trying to ex excavate. She doesn't want that stuff drying in there, and she doesn't want it trapping herself. So this is a delicate time for her. She's using her body as a bulldozer, and she goes in, gets into the resin, and then backs out, pushing the resin out, spilling it down the tree. And here she is working as a bulldozer, pushing it out, going in, getting more, and so on. This is a real struggle. If she doesn't do it right, she'll die. Uh, here she is. It looks like she's high centered, doesn't it? Um, she's all the way up to her belly. I don't think an insect has a belly, but you know what I mean. She's, all the, she's high centered in that stuff, no longer able to walk. She was now paddling through it, like a dog, uh, doggy paddling across a pond. Um, and she uh, persisted and she kept going. And one of the things that happens when she's doing this is she's swallowing some of that resin. One of the components in the resin is something called alpha pinene. It's a monoterpene. And it goes down into her gut. Bacteria in her gut transform that into a pheromone. That pheromone is an aggregation pheromone. It's going to call other beetles in. She defecates it out. Uh, uh, and. The, the frass in that um, gallery is sometimes pushed out as she's moving things out, but um, the, the pheromone emanates from that frass and from the material that falls out of the tunnel, and it forms a plume that goes downstream of downwind of the tree a few hundred yards, maybe half a kilometer, quite a distance. And what that, that, that um, pheromone does two things. To the males, it says, I'm here and I'm ready. To the females, it says, I've got a good tree. Come help me kill it. And so once she has got that pheromone out into the air, they start. And they'll start from hundreds of yards away, and they're converging on this tree. The, uh, this is the struggle. And within a day or maybe two days, it's decided. Either that tree kills all the beetles, or the beetles kill the tree. The beetles must kill the tree in order to reproduce. Um, oh. Now, uh, here is the males are a little bit smaller than the females. And here is a male who has come answering that call. She's scooping things in and out. She doesn't realize it, but she's burying him in, in resin. And I thought he was dead, and that's why I, I took this picture. Uh, in fact, he was still going, and uh, just as determined as she was. And they both went inside for a moment nuptial. Uh, and the following day, she would have been laying eggs. It doesn't, now, um, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the tree wins. And uh, if she doesn't do it right, or if the resin is thicker, or if it's really dry out and she's a little slow, she gets trapped in it. And this is a very common sight. There's a, a dried resin, uh, a pitch tube. The pitch tube has almost no frass or poop in it. And that means there's no gallery up there. She hasn't been pooping inside the tree. This is fairly clear resin. And she's dead right there. So uh, sometimes you'll find a dozen beetles like that on the outside of a tree. <clears throat> if it works, um, oh, uh, so the battle is decided in a, in a few, uh, one to two days. It doesn't mean the tree is automatically dead, but uh, if the tree's fate is sealed, what the, the beetles have to do is they have to drain the oleoresin pressure or the resin pressure to zero. As soon as they do that, the females are free to build the galleries with impunity. And in doing that, they've really inoculated the tree with blue stain fungus. Once they've done that, there's no turning back. The tree can't recover. It's now got blue stain all throughout the, 
throughout the insides. The phloem is considerably damaged, and there's a whole bunch of beetles, and the resin pressure's down to zero. Watering the tree after that is not going to do any good. Uh, its fate is sealed. It doesn't turn red for another 10 months, but its fate is sealed. Inside, the female drills upward through the phloem. She goes directly upward, and as she goes upward, she puts little niches in the side of her gallery, and in those niches, in each niche, she puts an egg. Can you count five eggs? Some can. One, two, three, four, five. She can lay about 60 eggs. That's going to be critically important uh, in a little while. Now, those eggs develop into little larvae in a couple of days, and the larvae don't go up, they go straight out. So it looks like a Christmas tree growing underneath the bark. And here are the, uh, um, the traces drilled by the larvae. Here's, this would have been straight up and down here, and here they go horizontally out. Pretty soon, the phloem, and the phloem is all the tubing system that brings sugars and proteins down from the needles to the trunk and to the roots. The phloem looks like this, and it's been destroyed by tunneling uh, the vertical galleries and then the horizontal um, uh, tunnels that the uh, larvae excavate. Plus, you can see that the wood is dark. That's blue stain fungus. But the blue stain fungus does more, uh, and the blue stain fungus grows inside of this, and the, the larvae eat that. The, even the adults eat it. So this is what they're living on inside the tree. But in addition, that blue stain larvae goes beyond the phloem, which is just the inner layer of the bark, and penetrates the wood. There, xylem cells are the tubing that brings water up from the roots and feeds the, the leaves. So tunneling has destroyed the phloem. No sugars can get down. Um, blue stain fungus has clogged the xylem. No water can get, up, can get up. That tree is now strangled. It's going to look green for the next 10 months, but it's strangled. The larvae um, go through five stages, getting bigger and bigger, and then they turn into a pupae. And there's a pupae on the right. It looks a little bit different, and I can see a wing there. Whoops. Uh, here's another picture of a pupae, and uh, there's the wing, there's the ridges along the back, and the eye begins to pick up some pigment first. So this will begin to darken, and the eyes darken first. They're red first, and then they turn solid black with the red pigment. The pupae turns into a callow, meaning yellow, or teneral, meaning soft adult. And here you can see it's slightly yellow. The teneral, or ca callow, adult here turns into a fully pigmented adult there and that animal is now ready to get out. It gets out by drilling exit holes, exactly its own diameter, perfectly round. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And uh, sometimes you can see that a tree has released hundreds or thousands of beetles. Now, that life cycle that I just told you started in August, later in August eggs were laid. Um, by the time um, uh, the, the calendar turns to the new year, they're fourth or fifth star larvae and they're absolutely quiescent. They can't do anything once it gets below 5.5 .5 degrees centigrade. Pupae form at the beginning of next summer and then the adults get out in August. So it takes a full year. The flight season, from the time that the first beetles appear in the, uh, in the summer, usually a few will appear in the last two weeks of July, just a few. 
Then there's a flood of them in the second and third week of August. The flight period covers about 50 days. And it, it peaks in the second and third week of August, and that's how it's been. That's how it's been as long as people have studied bark beetles up until two years ago. It's changing. And the life cycle that I just told you is some of the beetles are still doing that, but some of them are doing something altogether different. Here we go. <clears throat> this is my bark beetle site. Uh, it's at the, our or CU's mountain research station. It's 24 miles from Boulder. And the peaks in the back are part of the Indian Peaks Wilderness. Uh, the Arapaho Glacier, visible from our, from our campus, is just out of the picture to the left. Niwot Ridge, the site of many studies of CU scientists and, and their graduate students, is just out of sight to the right. And my bark beetle site is right about there. It's a beautiful place to work, and we're allowed to manipulate things a little bit. And here's what we do. First of all, why did we start this study? I was up at this site uh, June two summers ago, three summers ago, and bark beetles were landing on my shirt. It was June 15th. My graduate student, Scott Ferenberg, said, oh yeah, I saw them June 2nd. They were out then, too. So I reported that to an entomologist at the Forest Service, and he said, uh, no. Uh, and I said, uh, what do you mean, no? And he said, you didn't see bark beetles. And I said, yeah, they were bark beetles. They were landed on my shirt. We watched them drilling into the trees. He said, I don't know what you saw, but it wasn't bark beetles. And I said, why are you saying that? And he said, bark beetles don't fly in June. They fly a few in August, or a few in July. They fly in August. That's it. And so I thought, my goodness, what I've just seen is considered to be heresy by the people that have been studying this all their lives. I'm going to follow this up in a big way. So one of the things we did was to ask ourselves, OK, they're flying much earlier than they had been. Why? Well, fortunately, about 100 yards from our bark beetle site is a long-term meteorological station with data going back to 1953. And um, uh, I was looking at this slide one time, and I, uh, I had this little tiny epiphany. The blue line is weather. And weather goes up and down and up and down and up and up and up and down and up and down and up. And sometimes it goes wildly from year to year. That's weather. Long-term trends a climate, and the climate is changing. Who's been to Glacier National Park? OK. Everybody needs to go. You need to go soon. Because when Glacier National Park was established, it, ha it had 150 glaciers in it. Today, it has fewer than 50. Two thirds of them are gone. All of them are going to be gone before the people in the front row's hair goes gray. 20 years at most, they'll all be gone. It could be 10 years. They'll all be gone, and we're going to have to rename it Ain't, Ain't Got No Glaciers Anymore National Park. Uh, so the climate is changing. Uh, there is no doubt about that. And as a matter of fact, let me show you for our bark beetle site, or 100 yards from it, exactly how much it's changing. The top line is total annual degree days. If, an, if a day's average temperature is 10 degrees centigrade, it's one day. One times 10 is 10, and that's one day. Do that every day throughout the year, and uh, that is total annual degree days. So let's look to see how that has changed over the years. In the 1970s, 570. 584, 722 in the 1990s, 820. Highly significant, a 44% increase. A 44% increase. Now let's do it for not the entire year, but just up until July 1, spring temperatures. Remember, I saw beetles in June. And I thought 
spring has to be really the time when it's really changing. So now we're going to do degree days uh, from the 70s on. 128, 135, 175, 202. That's a 58% increase in a time period that I can remember. In a time period that I've been at CU. The climate is changing and the bark beetles are changing in response to that. What we did was, because I knew that the bark beetle establishment was very wary of this new story, was we went out and we certified trees. There were four of us, we would gather around a tree, we would stare at it for a little while, even climb it a little bit, look over it carefully, make sure that there were no hits of any beetles, no marks, you know, none of the, uh, none of the pitch tubes. When we said, okay, we agree, uh, it hasn't been hit, we label it permanently, that is a certified tree, it's never been hit. Now we go back and we visit it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout the summer. And if there's a pitch tube in it, we take a picture of it. The picture has a date on it, and we now know a pitch tube was seen on this date. It had not been hit before, uh, uh, that is, through, throughout the winter. So now we had a rough idea when the beetles were hitting the trees. We could survey beetles by putting up Lindgren traps. Lindgren traps are simple, and yet they're sort of neat, too. Uh, they have the sex pheromone on them. You can buy the sex pheromone. It comes in a little plastic bag, and that little plastic bag is hanging right there. This is a series of funnels, and the, the beetles come to that pheromone just like they would come to a tree emanating uh, a tri uh, aggregation pheromone. They hit the funnels, and they go bump, 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 and they land, up, land in the white cup filled with water and ethanol, and they, they die there. So we get a count every two days of how many beetles are about and what sorts of predators are also following that plume of aggregation pheromone. Because the very clever predators know if they follow the aggregation pheromone, they find bark beetles. Pretty clever. Okay. To make a long story short, here's what we've got. In response to the 58% increase in degree days early in spring, beetles are now emerging in mid-May fully two months earlier than they did, let's say, 20 years ago. Two months earlier. The flight season has increased. It's gotten much earlier and a little later. It's now increased from 50 days to 120 days. There's beetles out all summer, and they start in May. It's still snowing up there occasionally in May, but there's, other, there's days when it's warm in May, too. Now, here's the remarkable thing. Bark beetles do not diapause. Some insects have a programmed stop in them. These have no stop. They are, their development is simply driven by temperature. So if it's warm, they develop faster. It's just that simple. And the galleries that, be, that begin now two months earlier than they've ever begun before are exposed to the full summer temperatures. And the remarkable thing is the eggs put in in May and June don't take a year to develop. They're out in August. That part of the life cycle has gone from one year down to two months because it can start so much earlier. That means that a female starting in May or June has offspring two months later, not 12 months later. Her offspring are out in August. That's the regular time. They go through their normal life cycle, but because it's a little bit warmer, their offspring are out in May and June. Two generations per year. This beetle has never seen that before, at least not that we know of. Who can say what happened 12,000 years ago? But at least now, they're pulling off two generations per year. Some of them. Others are still doing, we see beetles of both types up there. Now, you might ask yourself, or you might say, who cares? One generation, two generations, what difference does it make? Um, and here, here's a, a, just a little 
picture to bring this home. This is the historic life cycle. It starts in August with, uh, with animals coming out of red trees. There's the beetle. They attack another tree. They go to a green tree. They attack it. They're laying eggs two, two to three days later. The temperature is now cooling. And there are larvae in the tree in October. But it takes them all of this time. Nothing happens there because it's too cold. Begins to warm up. The larvae develop. And they're out again in August, a full 12 months. Now they start in May. They emerge from red, from red trees. They go to green trees. They attack them. Eggs turn into adults in August. They go to green trees. They attack them. And eggs are out a day later. Who cares? And the answer is, look at the difference. It's not 60 plus 60. It's 60 times 60. 20 years ago, a, be a female could produce 60 offspring in a year. Now, if she gets out in May or June, she's got 60 by August. Those 60 offspring then give her 3,600 grandchildren. Her 60 children, 3,600 grandchildren. And so a female that used to put out 20, 60 can now put out in the same time period 3,660 beetles. All of a sudden, we begin to have some insight as to why we are seeing trees killed, for, um, not only the whole forest, but over the horizon and over the horizon and over the horizon again. This number of beetles in the air hasn't been seen before. Now, not all of them are doing it, but some of them are. And that reproductive advantage has completely changed the game. <clears throat> Is there going to be any compensation? We have lots and lots of deer in our green belt in Boulder. And because we have lots and lots of deer, the number of mountain lions have, have increased. Uh, up in uh, Yellowstone, they have lots and lots of elk. And because there's so many elk, the, uh, the number of wolves have skyrocketed. The predators should increase. So won't that happen? Don't bark beetles have predators? And my flip answer has always been, well, apparently not enough of them. Uh, but uh, actually, here's a, a fuller example. Uh, there are woodpeckers that, uh, that find them beneath the bark and take them out. The bark beetles are not going to be able, the woodpeckers cannot respond to an exploding population because they put out just a few eggs a year. You need to have something that has several generations per year to keep up with these beetles. So the woodpeckers aren't going to be able to do what we would love them to do. Darkling beetles could. Darkling beetles follow the attraction aggregation pheromone. They go into the tunnels. They develop sooner. And here's a, a mobile darkling beetle that has found an essentially immobile larvae. And it's, it's just found a gold mine. It will feast now for several days. Uh, and that larvae uh, cannot get away at all. <clears throat> Here's one that I just think is neat. Uh, who has seen the movie Aliens? A few, a few. Um, so the, uh, the parasitic wasps were all over us this spring. We were using ethanol to, to, catch, uh, to kill the beetles. Ethanol is also a sign of damaged wood. They, the parasitic wasps, follow plumes of ethanol to find damaged trees. They have bark beetles in them. They then walk around on that tree, and this is wild. They walk around on the tree, and they can hear the larvae underneath the bark. And they listen, and they figure out exactly where that larvae is. And that female can jam that ovipositor through the bark, nail the larva, and inject one egg. The larva goes, ow, I'm OK, I'm OK. Uh, but it's not OK, because a few days later, that egg hatches, and the larvae is now being eaten from the inside out. And a parasitic wasp will erupt from the larval uh, bark beetle. Um, Long-legged flies also follow that aggregation pheromone. 
lots of their larvae underneath the, uh, the bark. And this larva of a long-legged fly is sucking this larva dry. Great big milkshake. These are the ones that responded most this year. They didn't respond last year, but they did respond this year. And then this tail gets grisly. Uh, watch this. <clears throat> there was a time when these uh, red-bellied clarids were really abundant in springtime. And this May, we were finding traps like this. In this trap, there's a bark beetle, and there's a bark beetle, and virtually everything else in here is a clarid. From three, three traps, we got seven bark beetles and 48 of their predators, the, the red-bellied clarids. The clarids were taking them off the trees as fast as they could land. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm watching the end of a bark beetle epidemic. There's too many parasites or uh, predators for the bark beetles to take the several hours that they need to taste the tree, try another tree, begin to drill into it. That takes hours. And these guys are all over them. Until Scott and I were emptying a trap. A red-bellied clarid had just gone into it. Um, most of the ethanol had evaporated off. And this thing was just swimming around in there. He said, give me some more ethanol. I, uh, we haven't got all day. I've got to end this. So he poured the ethanol into there, and the, uh, the clarid stopped struggling in about 10 seconds. But then something came out. This is not part of the beetle. This is called the horsehair worm. And this thing kept coming and coming. It wound up, it was longer than the beetle itself. I have been in slot canyons where I've seen horsehair worms that long. They get into Mormon crickets and praying mantids. And they're, they're a nematode. And they have the most remarkable control over an insect. Um, one of these can get into an insect and begin to eat it. They take the reproductive system first. Then they begin to take the musculature. They leave some of it. Then they begin to take the uh, digestive system. When they sense that everything is uh, going to crash, the, the, their host is going to die, they drive that animal to jump into the water. It has to find a, uh, a pool. People have watched Mormon crickets be driven a mile to jump into a pool whereupon they drown. And immediately the horsehair worm comes out. The horsehair worm in a, in a Mormon cricket can be that long and they can lay 800 million eggs. So if they get into a, a pond or a pool, they fill it up. It becomes a dilute solution of eggs. And the next insect that comes and takes a sip swallows an egg, maybe a couple of them. And so that's, that's the life cycle of these horsehair worms. A horsehair worm uh, was inside of this one. And then we began to look. Many of them had them. And all of a sudden, the red-bellied clarids, boom, they went from far outnumbering the beetles to we weren't catching them for the next week or so. Just made the whole population crash. Isn't it wild? You begin to understand the interactions in a forest. There are the trees minding their own business. Bark beetles come along and kill them. Clarids come along and save the day. Parasites come along and destroy the clarids, releasing the beetles and allowing the, attack, the attacks to resume. Who could have anticipated all of that? What does the future hold? <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I think it was three years ago, a Colorado Forest Service person said, within five years, every adult lodgepole pine is going to be dead in the state of Colorado. That person wasn't very far wrong. I think a few of them are going to make it because they have their roots and streams and they've got lots of resin, I think. Does that mean that the lodgepole pine forests are going to disappear? And the answer is no, because the bark beetles love the big trees. They can, they can manage with little, the medium-sized trees, but they can't manage a little tree. The phloem is too thin. They can't put a gallery into it. It doesn't work. 
and so they don't kill the little trees. So the forests that have little trees in them will, will do just fine. Um, but there's going to be a lot less of the mature ones, of the big ones, for sure. The predators will become more numerous, or will they? What will the parasites do with them? And what will their predators do? That's all too complex to anticipate. Now, we will have fewer lodgepole pine. That's a guarantee. But we're going to have more, more what? Ooh, I heard that. Aspen. <clears throat> before, uh, before Western Europeans came to the Southern Rocky Mountains, there was a lot more aspen then than there is today. By putting out fires and putting uh, horses and cows on, uh, on the hillsides, we have, we have pushed the ecosystem to favor trees, uh, the, the conifers, and the bark beetles are going to undo some of that. This is the silver lining in a very dark cloud. You can't go around hanging your head, uh, being dour the rest of your life because the bark beetles came. Can't do anything about it. I don't think we can undo it at all. So you may as well look for the bright future and say, we're going to enjoy more aspen next year and next year after that. So what have I told you? Mountain pine beetle epidemics are natural but this one is unprecedented in its intensity and its geographic range. Temperatures are increasing, particularly in spring. As a response, beetles fly more than twice as long, more than two months earlier. Galleries started in May, get out in August, allowing uh, the reproductive potential of the beetle to go through the ceiling. Some predator populations are gonna respond but that's going to be complex because predators have predators and predators have parasites. Who can tell what's going to happen? Clim but here's one thing we do know. Some people are skeptical about climate change. But go to Glacier National Park and see for yourself. And remember the line that I drew through, through the temperature data. Remember a 58% increase in the spring um, degree days. And remember that the bark beetles are driven to do this because their metabolic rates, their development rates, are strictly temperature dependent. More warmer days make them go faster. And that's all I have for you tonight.